Tonight's event is brought to you by the uh, Menard Family George Washington Forum. Uh, GWF is a civic and education initiative which aims not just to promote uh, viewpoint diversity here at OU, but also to provide a forum where sometimes contentious subjects can be discussed and debated in a reasoned and reasonable way. And tonight's event, like all GWF events, is made possible not by public funds, um, but by the generous donations of Ohio uh, University alumni and by grants from private foundations. And I have to thank the Menard family for making tonight's event possible. So what's tonight's talk about? Well, there was a moment um, in spring 2020 when the language piped out to American University faculty and students from their administrators changed. Changed earlier at some places than others, but by summer 2020 here, the change at Ohio University was complete. There was no more talk about antiquated concepts like equality and freedom and difference, but alike, and instead, we heard about equity and inclusion and diversity, and even our office's titles got changed. We now have an Office of Diversity and Inclusion uh, and an Office of University Equity and Civil Rights Compliance. Not so long ago, five years ago, um, during the administration of Ohio University's first and only African-American president, the university professed itself committed to equal opportunity for all people and pledged to uphold the university's commitment to a just and diverse community to take leadership in ensuring an atmosphere of equality. Now, if you look at the university's diversity and inclusion commitment statement, you'll find the word equality nowhere in it. Instead, we learned that the university is committed to inclusive excellence and achieving the benefits of diversity through practices, policies, curricula, and programs that lead to a welcoming, receptive, supportive, and affirming environment, especially for those who've been marginalized. Now, to the uninitiated, this linguistic shift may sound like a distinction without a difference. What, after all, is the big deal about bending equality in favor of equity? In fact, it makes enormous difference, as the Cognizetti know. Ohio University's Office of University Equity and Civil Rights Compliance, for instance, now presumably doesn't aim to treat students, faculty, and staff equally, but equitably. And why would it want to treat people equally? For to work to ensure equality of opportunity or equality of outcome or equality is merely to be not racist, which is now a sort of benighted status. To work for equity, by contrast, is to be anti-racist. Itself a concept which is part of an argot which tonight's speaker calls the new elite, a new elite heavily represented in higher education. As Musa Algarbi notes, the new elite traffics in symbols and rhetoric, images and narratives, data and analysis, ideas and abstractions, which distinguish them from those who don't. So tonight's speaker, Musa Algarbi, is one of the most trenchant students of the new social justice discourse, sometimes referred colloquially to as wokeism. He's shown a willingness publicly to interrogate received wisdom, which is both bracing and refreshing. And it's why we've invited him here tonight. So Musa comes to us from New, from New York City, where he's uh, uh, finishing his degree in sociology at Columbia University. There, he's a Paul Lazarsfeld Fellow in the Department of Sociology. And in fall 2021, he was this SNF Agora Institute Visiting Fellow at the Johns Hopkins University. He's worked as Communications Director at Heterodox Academy, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the New Republic, the Guardian, and many other popular outlets. And in 2023, Princeton University Press will publish his first book, We Have Never Been Woke, Social Justice Discourse, Inequality, and the Rise of a New Elite. He's made the trek here to Southeast Ohio, and I hope you'll join with me in welcoming him here to Ohio University. So hey everybody, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, you know, as noted, my, my book is uh, called um, We Have Never Been Woke, Social Justice Discourse, Inequality, and the Rise of a New Elite. And so basically what the book is exploring is that, you know, uh, since the post-World War II period, there has been this significant shift in the global economy in favor of 
um, in favor of people who traffic, as, 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 uh, as Robert put it, in, in symbols and rhetoric and data and analysis and ideas and images. And, um, so uh, this group of people, uh, I call them in the book, drawing from Bourdieu, I refer to them as symbolic capitalists. They've been referred to by other names in other works. They've been called the professional managerial class, for instance, is a popular name for talking about the constellation of people I'm talking about. Um, they've been called uh, class X, bourgeois, bohemians, uh, you know, uh, titles proliferate for them. So what's striking is that as this new elite constellation has sort of risen in influence and risen in um, affluence, uh, inequality in America has, various forms of inequality in America have sort of grown radically. And so what the book basically does is it charts the rise of this new elite. It looks at um, inequality uh, in America and inequality within, the, the, within these symbolic capitalist institutions, so uh, finance, law, um, uh, because you know what's one thing that's striking is that um, these institutions that are associated with the symbolic economy are some of the most hierarchical and parochial institutions in the entire economy. Um, but the but the people who participate in them often think about themselves as egalitarians. And this is kind of the core thing that the text is trying to explore: is that this new elite, like all elites. They have narratives that they like to tell about why they deserve to be in the position they're in, why their political opponents don't deserve power, in fact, why they deserve suffering, possibly. Um, and, uh, and so the book explores the, the narratives that this new elite formation tells about itself and uh, how, how well those narratives relate to uh, realities within their own institutions and within the economy more broadly. This is the kind of core tension that the book is trying to explain. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to start um, for this talk by uh, going through a series of episodes um, that kind of led me to write this book and, uh, and that help illustrate some of the core puzzles that the text is trying to wrestle with. Um, so one, one important bit of background, uh, through 2016, I'd spent basically my whole life in this smallish southern Arizona military town, about 40 minutes from the U.S.-Mexico border, in a community that was helping keep the state red. <laughs> so like, uh, in this last election, it went Biden, uh, but it's been, uh, but this kind of long march to purple for Arizona, the district that I was in was a district that was basically holding, holding the state red for a long time. Um, and I came of age politically in the aftermath of 9-11 and the war on terror. And so at that time, uh, I personally subscribed to what you might call the sort of banal liberal understanding of um, who is responsible for various social evils. Those damn Republicans, sorry, those darn Republicans. Like, uh, if only people here in Podunk, Arizona, I thought, could be more like the enlightened denizens of New York, then man, what a beautiful country this could be. You know, um, in the lead up to the 2016 election, though, I grew increasingly concerned that many of the scholars and journalists I admired who lived in these, you know, major metropolitan areas and were associated with these um, knowledge uh, producing institutions that I greatly admired, um, they seem to have this epistemic bubble with respect to Trump and his prospects for being elected. And for a while, I struggled with understanding this apparent mental block. But then when I arrived in New York City myself, I could clearly see how it could come about, how this block could come about. So at first blush, for instance, the Upper West Side uh, seemed to confirm my own earlier perceptions about enlightened cosmopolitans. It, you know, it seemed to, um, like if I would walk to the West Side Market to get groceries, for instance, on any given walk, like maybe 15% of the people who would be on the street would be South Asian or East Asian. There'd be covered Muslim ladies, gay couples, transgender women, large numbers of black and Hispanic people. The whites that, that I encountered in Manhattan they, all, they were all seemed super liberal, how they talked, how they presented themselves. They, they, seemed like, they seemed like almost a living embodiment of NPR. And I, and I, and I don't, 
And I don't mean that as a knock on them. Like, I liked NPR. This it was great. I was like, you know. Um, <laughs> but after a while, kind of Im immersed in this milieu, I came to see how, like, if this was someone's understanding of America, if this was someone's primary experience of America day to day, it might be difficult to understand how someone like Trump could win or hold appeal. But of course, there's this whole other America, uh, the America that I was raised in, an America that's very, very different from the one that I currently inhabit. And each of these Americas tend to disdain one another for a variety of reasons. And, you know, on some level, I understood the disdain that people in places like New York felt towards the communities that I was raised in. It shames me to admit it now. It really, truly shames me. But at times, I felt myself that disdain at various points. Uh, and I'd already said a lot of this in the years leading up to my time at Columbia. But whatever vestiges remained were destroyed immediately after the 2016 election. So a few months after I arrived at Columbia University, Trump won. And again, I didn't find this surprising at all. I spent most of the 2016 election cycle begging anyone who would listen to take Trump seriously. Um, but most of my peers in Manhattan went into election night confident that we were on the right side of history and that the election would probably be a blowout. And that's, of course, not what ended up happening. And in the days that followed, many Columbia students claimed to be so traumatized by the electoral result that they couldn't do their homework or their tests. They needed time off, they, they insisted. And there were two things about that that were striking to me. First, these are students at an Ivy League university, overwhelmingly people from wealthy backgrounds. Even if they didn't come from wealth, they're likely to leave well-positioned. After all, Columbia is an elite school. And by this, I mean it's a school that is designed to cultivate elites and to serve elites. And this is not a secret. <laughs> Students choose to attend a school like Columbia instead of their local land-grant university precisely because they themselves aspire to be more elite than most other college graduates. And of course, college graduates are themselves an elite socioeconomic minority. So the students at Columbia are striving to be an elite among elites, right? Hence, even in their own descriptions, and so this is the contradiction is that even in their own descriptions, about what the impact of the election would be, that the poor and the vulnerable would get crushed underfoot while elites flourished more than ever. Guess what, we're the elites, right? So like realistically speaking, we're the type of people at Columbia who stood to benefit from someone like Trump in the students' own narratives. We certainly shouldn't be thinking of ourselves as victims or as the little guy, right? But there seemed to be strikingly little recognition of these realities on campus. Instead, Many students seem to view themselves as somehow uniquely vulnerable to Trump and his regime as being especially threatened or victimized, and so they demanded all these accommodations for themselves. And the university administration eagerly obliged, of course. But meanwhile, there's this whole other constellation of folks around the students who seem to be literally invisible to them. The landscapers, the maintenance workers, the people preparing food, the security guards. There was no movement on behalf, on their behalf after the election. And these were the people, according to um, the prevailing narratives who stood to lose the most from Trump's victory. While the students were overwhelmingly wealthy or upwardly mobile, these workers were generally from humble backgrounds. They were disproportionately immigrants. They were disproportionately minorities. Yet the students didn't begin by demanding that those people need a day off. They didn't demand that those people need higher pay or better benefits or protections. Instead, they were focused on themselves. And nor were these ignored laborers the people with the most at stake in this election and the students' own narratives. These workers weren't saying that they needed time off because they were too traumatized. They weren't painting themselves as victims. Although the classrooms were full of tears in the days that followed, no one ever saw the janitors, for instance, making a scene, sobbing uncontrollably about politics as they scrubbed rich kids' mess out of the toilets. They showed up to work the next day and did their jobs. And the juxtaposition to me was sobering. It was sobering. And I want to be clear, I'm not picking on Columbia students here. So when I left campus walking around the Upper West Side or other affluent parts of Manhattan, similar scenes were playing out. The winners of the prevailing order were out on the streets, walking around in a daze like a bomb went off, comforting each other and weeping for the disadvantaged, even as they were chauffeured around and waited upon even more than usual, because they were just too distraught to do anything themselves. And they were able to indulge themselves in this way, of course, because the people who were serving them, i.e. the people with the most at stake in this election according to their own narratives, those people showed up to work per usual. And New York City was hardly unique in any of this. Other symbolic economy hubs had similar scenes playing out. So LA, DC, Chicago, Seattle, Boston, you name it. 
The same drama that I observed at Columbia was also unfolding at colleges and universities across the country. And this is precisely what I found so troubling and so difficult to shake off. It's because it wasn't a matter of my own school. It was about this broader disjuncture between symbolic economy elites and their narratives about the world and realities on the ground. And gradually I came to have a different understanding of the diversity that I was so impressed with in my first interactions with the city as well. So for one thing, of course, the, the diverse people in Manhattan exist in largely separate social worlds. You know, racial and ethnic composition of networks tends to be quite homogenous. Um, demographically, ideologically, socioeconomically, it's just this very narrow block of people who are invited to participate in the symbolic profession, so in journalism and academia and finance and law and any of it, while most of the rest of America, their perspectives, their priorities are largely excluded or derided. So the diversity such as it was turned out to be a lot more superficial than it seemed to be at first glance. And there were also in Manhattan stark divisions, a stark division of labor and of social roles that tracked along the lines of race and gender that everyone seemed to just take as natural. So in New York City and other places like that, you have disposable servants, basically, who will clean your house, watch your kids, walk your dogs. One group of laborers repairs your food for you and another contingent of workers delivers it to your house. If you need something from the store, someone goes shopping for you and drops it off at your place. People will show up at your door and take you wherever you wanna go with the push of a button. And it's mostly minorities and immigrants from particular racial and ethnic backgrounds who fill these roles as disposable laborers, while other people from other racial and ethnic backgrounds are the ones being served. And all this is basically taken for granted, that this is the normal way society operates. This is how it goes in liberal New York. And yet, the way things are in places like New York or LA, this is not how things are in many other parts of the country. For instance, in other American locales, a person buying a pair of shoes and a person selling that pair of shoes are likely to be the same race, white typically, and the socioeconomic gaps between the buyer and the seller tend to be much smaller. Even the most sexist or bigoted rich white person in many other contexts wouldn't be able, they just wouldn't be able to exploit women and minorities at the level of the typical, that the typical liberal professional in a city like Seattle or San Francisco or Chicago does just in their day-to-day -day lives because the infrastructure isn't there. It's these progressive bastions that are associated with the symbolic economy that have these kind of well-oiled machines for casually exploiting and discarding the vulnerable, the desperate, and the disadvantaged and it's largely democratic voting professionals who take advantage of them, even as they conspicuously lament inequality. And I began to see patterns like these everywhere in New York and other cities as, I, as I've traveled around the Northeast Corridor, you know, um, same, 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 same. Um, and these contradictions grew especially pronounced in the wake of COVID-19 and the pandemic um, and the unrest that followed George Floyd's murder. So even as they casually discarded service workers, for instance, to fend for themselves, and they increased their exploitation of the essential workers who remained so that they could stay comfortably ensconced in their own homes. Individuals and institutions associated with the symbolic economy aggressively sought to paint themselves as allies for the marginalized and the disadvantaged. Billions were donated to groups like Black Lives Matter. Anti-racist literature shot to the top of the bestseller charts. Organizations assigned anti-bias training and appointed chief diversity officers at an extraordinary pace. Meanwhile, inequalities continued to grow, and indeed their growth accelerated over the course of the pandemic and the racial uprisings, even in the midst of this great awakening. In my neck of the woods, one of the most striking scenes that occurred over and over again over the summer of 2020 was that on Friday afternoons, most Friday afternoons, demonstrators would gather in the middle of um, Broadway Boulevard, holding up signs that said Black Lives Matter and things like this. The people doing this were typically older white folks, uh, academics and professors by the looks of them. They would shake these signs as cars drove by and the cars would occasionally honk as if to signal their agreement and the demonstrators would cheer. Ooh. Okay, so on, <laughs> on several, uh, on several occasions as I walked by these demonstrations, demonstrators were engaging in this ritual literally right in front of, sharing the median with homeless black dudes who didn't have any shoes. They were crowding the benches that the homeless were using 
uh, uh, crowding their stuff to cheer on Black Lives Matter, and the black dude right in front of them seemed to be invisible, again, invisible, a piece of scenery akin to a bench, an obstruction that they had to work around to make sure they didn't fall as they were shaping their Black Lives Matter signs at passing cars. Indeed, many from the same demographic, the same demographic that was doing these demonstrations, would ultimately band together to successfully lobby the city to remove most of the homeless people from the Upper West Side. During the pandemic, many uh, hotels were converted into temporary shelters for the homeless. And in a district, my district, that voted 95-5 Clinton, in the midst of a global pandemic and a racial justice movement that they wholeheartedly supported in principle, Upper West Side liberals banded together to declare not in my backyard to the homeless, and they successfully pushed the city to move the poor somewhere else. Now, a huge share of this undesirable population happened to be black, but apparently the sense in which their lives mattered was complicated. So seeing scenes like these play out, I couldn't help but wonder, who, who are these street corner BLM demonstrations for? Like, what's the point of it? There isn't really any plausible story where getting cars to honk at, at your sign would lift anyone out of poverty, would prevent even one single person from getting killed by police, would release, get anyone released from prison. There didn't seem to be any relationship at all, not at all, between the cause these demonstrators were claiming to support and the means through which they were choosing to support it. There was no relationship between the seriousness of the problems that they claimed to be consumed with and the ways they went about advocating for that cause, cheering on the streets when people honked at their signs. I found this juxtaposition kind of maddening. George Orwell once said, writing a book is a horrible, exhausting struggle, like a long bout with some painful illness, and that no one would ever do it, basically, if they weren't driven by some kind of demon or, or uh, that they can't resist or understand. And it, basically, as a result of my time in New York, as a result of the experiences that I previously described and other similar incidences like them, I started to be consumed by a handful of questions. First, why is it the, the winners and the prevailing order, the affluent, the successful, the upwardly mobile, why is it that they seem so eager to paint themselves as helpless victims, as marginalized, as vulnerable, and as allies of the same? Indeed, the, most, the people, statistically speaking, the people most likely to identify as feminists or anti-racists or allies or liberal or progressive, they tend to be affluent, highly educated, liberal white people. What's up with that, I wondered. <laughs> and um, more importantly, if it's, a and if it's a genuine disadvantage, and in the book I show that, you know, the, the extent to, of, of systemic inequalities in America writ large, and especially within these um, cities that symbolic capitalists gravitate in, and in the institutions that they inhabit, like in academia, for instance, or journalism, or law, or the nonprofit space, any of these things. The inequalities are pronounced, and they track very clearly along the lines of race, gender, et cetera. So if it's a genuine disadvantage to be a woman, to be a minority, to be LGBTQ, to be disabled, and again, my, my own work shows that that seems to be the case, then why is it that elites are so eager to identify themselves as these very things? or to associate themselves with people who are, even to the point of bending the truth in order to do it. So there are all these cases of white people pretending to be minorities of, um, for instance, or of wealthy people pretending to be poor. It's striking at Columbia and other places like this, how many, uh, like poverty cosplaying. Um, or, uh, you know, of people who pretty much only partner with people who are their opposite gender, but de you know, declaring themselves as um, queer. Uh, so, so why is it that people are so eager to identify with these very identities that they describe as being harmful to themselves? What, and it's elites that, that really go out of their way to identify this way. Why? Um, how can it be that the people most concerned with what you might call 
ideological racism, so people saying or thinking or feeling the wrong thing about race, gender, sexuality, and the like. Why is it that the people who are most concerned about ideological racism also happen to be the people who benefit the most from what sociologists call systemic or institutionalized racism or sexism? And this is, I show this very clearly, is the case in the book. And we don't just passively benefit from systemic racism or sexism, these new elites, symbolic capitalists. We actively exploit and perpetuate the very inequalities that we conspicuously condemn. Our idiosyncratic lifestyles, our preferences, and social positions are profoundly and uniquely predicated on exclusion, exploitation, and condescension. I show. And so, and various forms, again, of inequality have grown more pronounced as symbolic capitalists have risen in power and influence. Our institutions are some of the most parochial and unequal in the entire economy. So how can it be that our lives are so heavily oriented around inequality, but we still view ourselves as egalitarians. And if social justice discourse and these symbolic gestures seem to have little to do with tangibly addressing various forms of injustice or inequality, if they don't seem to well reflect the actual will and interests of most of the people who they're supposed to be helped uh, by these gestures, then what do these performative displays actually accomplish? What functions do they serve for the elites who engage in them? Who actually stands to benefit from these behaviors and how? How does social justice discourse come to serve these alternative functions? How aware are participants of this gap between their lifestyles and their behaviors and their professed beliefs? How do they reconcile these tensions to the extent that they recognize them at all? These are the questions that, that kind of that I became kind of possessed by and that ultimately led to uh, this book. So um, we have never been woke is my sort of sociological attempt to wrestle with these questions. The title is the reference to Bruno Latour's uh, landmark book, We Have Never Been Modern. In that book, Latour argued that the stories that, moderns, that we moderns tell about ourselves about what set us apart from everyone else they actually, these narratives actually obscure the nature of the modern world, rendering it difficult for us to properly understand and address the problems of modernity. So we have never been woke, likewise argues that the narratives that knowledge economy elites tell ourselves about how we're on the right side of history, how we're the champions of the marginalized and disadvantaged, et cetera, these actually obscure the nature of how that marginalization comes about, of how that disadvantage persists, and it, inter and it interferes with our ability to address the social problems we conspicuously condemn, and in many cases leads to an exacerbation of those same problems. To illustrate some of the specific ways that social justice discourse can literally blind us to how social problems come about and persist, allow me to briefly introduce and discuss three interrelated phenomena that are referred to in the social and behavioral sciences literature as moral licensing, moral credentialing, and moral cleansing. So moral credentialing is a phenomenon where people become more likely to act in inegalitarian ways and critically become more convinced that their actions are non-biased after affirming their commitment to egalitarianism or engaging in behaviors that they interpret as egalitarian. Even if these acts are empty, like are non-substantive, like land acknowledgments or confessions of privilege or, or even things like having a black friend. So for instance, studies have shown that when people verbally affirm their commitment to, say, feminism, they become, they simultaneously become more likely to favor men in making decisions about hiring and promotion, for instance, but they become more confident that those decisions were non-biased. Or if they affirm their commitment to anti-racism, they actually become more likely to act in ways that favor other whites while being confident that race played no role in their decision. That's moral credentialing. We're especially likely to seek out and brandish moral credentials in the face of some kind of actual or anticipated questioning of our behavior. So if, if, we've, if we've done something or we're about to do something that we think might be controversial or suspicious to other people, we often remind ourselves and other people about what good people we are, say, by affirming these you know, narratives about anti-racism or feminism, and this tends to change how the behaviors in question are interpreted both by other people and by ourselves. Now I'll add, individuals do moral credentialing, institutions do it well. I'd be happy to talk in the Q&A about how institutions engage in the same kind of behaviors I'm talking about. 
But for now, I'm just going to focus on people, on, on individuals. OK, so where moral credentialing prevents us from recognizing our actions as immoral, moral licensing is a phenomenon where people engage in moralized rhetoric, where engaging in moralized rhetoric can make people feel entitled to engage in behaviors that they would otherwise be able to recognize as immoral, but to view those behaviors as OK for them at that moment under those circumstances. So in virtue of pro-social actions that people have done or plan to do, or even when people reflect on bad, bad things that they could have done but they didn't do, people can come to feel that it's more acceptable to take liberties that they would normally condemn in others. So in virtue of the sort of um, righteousness, self-righteousness self that people feel from pro-social acts, which again, the acts in question can just be symbolic gestures in practice, right? So, when people do something that they think is good, uh, even if it's just a symbolic gesture that's good, they can subsequently come to exempt themselves from the moral standards that they apply to others, confident that any good actions that they've done or will do will basically even things out, right? So you can do something wrong, but because you did something good, uh, it'll all balance out in the end or even be a net positive. So, increasing, so interestingly, this kind of thinking, this moral licensing, I'll, uh, in virtue of this good that I've done, I can do something bad, guilt-free. This seems to be a culturally bound phenomenon. So it's something that's unique to what psychologist Joseph Heinrich called weird countries. So Western, highly educated, industrial, rich, democratic countries. Uh, US, UK, Canada, places like that. Germany. In other contexts, people don't seem to view morality as a bank where you can basically deposit moral credits in order to engage in guilt-free violations later. But in Western um, weird countries, this is a way that people often think. And so to recap, moral credentialing helps us avoid seeing immoral behaviors as immoral in virtue of painting ourselves as a good person. Moral licensing provides states of exception for us to acceptably engage in otherwise problematic behaviors, behaviors that we otherwise would recognize as problematic. But sometimes, we engage in behaviors that we recognize are wrong, and we don't have a good excuse, we don't have a good justification. In these cases, we tend to engage in rituals of moral cleansing, and these are, these are behaviors that help us restore our sense that we're on the side of the angels, so to speak. And one of the most effective ways that we can come to feel morally good about ourselves after doing wrong is by pointing out wrongdoing in others. So research shows that condemning and especially sanctioning or punishing others for a moral failing helps alleviate our, our sense of guilt for that same failing, even if others' crimes weren't as significant as our own. Sometimes, we can be so effective at cleansing our guilt that we grow more self-righteous than we were before our moral failing. In these instances, moral cleansing can actually provide us with moral credentials or licenses. That is, it doesn't just eliminate our guilt over doing wrong. It can actually enable future bad conduct, but carried out with a clear conscience down the line. And there are peer effects for all of these phenomena. So when we observe people like us, people and institutions we identify with, making egalitarian pronouncements or gestures or taking pro-social actions, we become more likely to see those people and ourselves as egalitarian and to interpret subsequent inegalitarian behaviors from peers or ourselves as fundamentally fair or acceptable. So one disturbing implication of these cognitive tendencies is that in contexts where people go around denouncing racism, sexism, inequality to one another constantly, painting themselves as staunch advocates for social justice and condemning other people who are backwards or aggressive. ...and perpetuating inequality. So it would become almost literally impossible, like cognitively very difficult. It can be right in front of their face and they won't see it. And in part for this reason, these same people would engage in inequality reinforcing behaviors all the more while feeling incredibly self-righteous about their egalitarianism. That is, in environments where anti-racism, feminism, and other forms of diversity and inclusion are widely and very publicly embraced, it can actually become easier, not harder, easier for people to act in racist, sexist, or otherwise discriminatory ways while being convinced that their behaviors are fair and to actually have those behaviors perceived as fair by others who share their same leanings. In such context, each performative display of social justice can work to blind oneself and one's peers to important details about how various forms of inequality, exploitation, and exclusion are produced and maintained. 
they can generate both opportunities and temptations for oneself and one's peers to behave in ways that they might otherwise be able to recognize as immoral. Worse, people who are highly educated or cognitively sophisticated may actually be more prone to falling into these mental traps. So research has shown that people who have high GPAs or high IQ scores or high levels of educational attainment, et cetera, they, they actually tend to be especially prone to motivated reasoning, um, and they tend to be especially effective at mo motivated reasoning, precisely because they're better at arguing and they have more information at their disposal. They're really good at finding ways to believe a picture of the world that they want to, irrespective of the facts of the matter. High levels of creativity are also associated with immoral behavior for largely the same reason. Creative people are very good at coming up with excuses to justify their behaviors to themselves and to others. And so rather than being immune to these kind of cognitive phenomena in virtue of their high levels of knowledge or intellectual acumen, um, knowledge economy elites, people who work in things like tech or media, finance, law, they, may be, they seem to actually be the kind of people who are, might be more vulnerable than most to engaging in this kind of self-serving moral reasoning. And in any case, these cognitive tendencies are more consequential when carried out by social elites. So on their own, blind spots and biases are often kind of weird quirks that you know, people do and they, they create inconvenient situations for themselves. But when you have these kind of systematic biases and blind spots and they're combined with institutional power, this can create problems for many other people, not just for oneself. And especially it creates problems for people who are already in a vulnerable or precarious position. So for instance, insofar as phenomena like moral credentialing, moral licensing, or moral cleansing obscure the causes of various social problems, insofar as they lead the elites who are benefiting from the system and perpetuating the system to think of themselves as the good guys and not to blame, for instance, to look at other people instead of themselves, so insofar as they obscure the causes for various social problems, they can interfere with the formulation or implementation of effective strategies to address recognized social problems, leading to solutions that don't work or even cause harm. And insofar as elites are preoccupied with various forms of social injustice, but they can't see, they literally can't see how themselves or their allies are actually responsible for those problems, they tend to expropriate blame to others that they don't identify with Namely, their ideological, their political, or their professional rivals. Even if these other people don't benefit as much from the system as they themselves do, even if these other people don't exert as much influence over the system as they themselves do. And this tendency to expropriate blame can generate blowback uh, against the causes that these elites are ostensibly advocating for. So it can create blowback against civil rights create blowback against civil liberties, it can create blowback against the populations that you're supposed to be advocating for, it can help stoke reactionary politics. So in the new Jim Crow, for instance, Michelle Alexander highlights how elites turn poor and working class whites and people of color against one another, preventing the emergence of any kind of transracial class-based solidarity that could threaten elites' own financial interests or elites' social position. So Dr. Alexander's position was focused on tactics that are prevalent, although not exclusive to the right, like scapegoating minorities for social problems or encouraging a distinctly white conception of American nationalism. But intentionally or not, anti-racist scapegoating and the kind of moral cleansing rituals I've just described, they often function very similar to the behaviors that Michelle Alexander flagged in her book. They represent additional ways that upper class and wealthy whites, especially those associated with the left, often turn less affluent whites and people of color against one another by appearing almost exclusively concerned with minority groups and their alleged needs and preferences, although again, the, what they claim, there's like a wide gap between elite descriptions of, uh, and, and when you actually poll and survey the people they're trying, there's often these wide gaps, but um, by being exclusively concerned with the alleged needs or preferences of these minority populations by constantly denigrating whiteness and villainizing poor and working class whites. Elite anti-racists often end up reaffirming many of the narratives that racists tell. Um, so whites are being held to a different standard than minorities, middle and working class whites' values and interests and culture and way of life are under siege that minorities will and can only rise up at whites' expense. <clears throat> 
often white anti-racists end up sending the same kind of message, intentionally or not, the same kind of message that, that their political opponents, uh, they, they end up reaffirming basically the same picture of the world, providing evidence for that picture of the world and the ways that they engage on these issues. Moral Credentialing, moral licensing, and moral cleansing can help us understand how people who are not colorblind but ex are extremely color conscious can, precisely as a result of their egalitarian convictions, become more likely to engage in inegalitarian behaviors or reinforce re inegalitarian behaviors or states of affairs. Um, it can help explain how men, precisely, precisely in virtue of fact of identifying themselves as feminists, can actually become more likely to behave in ways that favor other men or harm women without recognizing themselves as doing so. And they often engage in these behaviors with a clear conscience and often respond with incredulity when it's suggested that they're behaving in a manner that's out of step with their professed ideals. So that was a little abstract. So, to, to, so for, to, let me conclude by sketching out a few sort of concrete examples for how these dynamics can play out in life. We'll start with the case of Morris Dees. So for those who don't know, Dees was an attorney who was almost single-handedly responsible for bankrupting the Ku Klux Klan. He subsequently founded an organization, the Southern Poverty Law Center, with other attorneys and activists to identify and combat hate groups in the South and in America writ large. Unfortunately, the organization was fairly notorious for its institutional culture. The people promoted to high-level positions were overwhelmingly whites, typically men. Women and minorities in the Southern Poverty Law Center frequently had their contributions minimized or stolen or overlooked. There was an extremely hostile atmosphere in the organization with regular sexualized and racialized jokes being directed at minority employees. And this all culminated recently with a massive reorganization of the center, the departure of Dees and other top executives from the organization, and a sweeping investigation of organizational practices. But here, we can see moral licensing and moral credentialing at work, right? So Dees and his allies, sure, they hired and promoted pretty much only other whites uh, and, and men, um, sure but not because of race, right? That's just the way it shook out. After all, they dismantled the Klan. They spend all day, every day fighting racism. How could their decisions possibly be race-based, right? And then sure, these and his allies, they felt free to take liberties with their comments. Sure, they regularly directed racist remarks towards their minority coworkers, but those were jokes. They're obviously not racist themselves. They spend all day, every day fighting racists, right? It turns out, that activists and scholars who work on these issues may be especially susceptible to this kind of thinking. Consider the example of Rachel Dolezal, for instance. So she was the former head of the Spokane, Washington chapter of the NAACP, a race scholar and an activist. She also system systematically misrepresented her racial and ethnic background, engaged in multiple hate crime hoaxes and many other forms of malfeasance. But when her behaviors were exposed and she was fired ultimately from the NAACP, even after that, she continues to insist to this day that her actions were strictly altruistic, aimed at liberating ultimately African Americans and everyone else from the illusion of race, that everything she did was oriented towards this moral aim. Perhaps a more striking example is to consider the case of Harvey Weinstein. So, so Weinstein was regarded as a liberal darling. He was known for helping elevate women in film and advance the careers of prominent actresses like Meryl Streep. He was a philanthropist who donated heavily to Democrats and to causes that helped women. He was also accused by more than 90 women of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and he aggressively sought to silence those he abused through a combination of threats and hush money and censorship. He's currently incarcerated after having been convicted of multiple sex crimes. And yet, in an interview with the New York Post from a hospital where he was undergoing treatment, Weinstein lamented that all of the great work that he did for helping women seemed to be overshadowed because of what happened. Now notice, not what he did, right, but what happened. This is moral licensing and credentialing in peak form. To the extent that Weinstein recognizes that he did anything wrong, he feels that it's ultimately outweighed by the good. And he laments the fact that others can't see this obvious truth. Even Harvey Weinstein still thinks that he's basically a good guy. And sure, maybe, you know, maybe he made some mistakes, but you know, on balance, he's a great feminist champion. For one final example, for instance, consider the case of 
former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who was likely held up, who was also held up as a great feminist ally, but who created a, an extremely toxic culture for the women around him. He was a serial harasser who likewise tried to silence those he wronged. When he was accused of wrongdoing, his moral credentials were so pronounced that people working at prominent feminist organizations rallied around him at first instead of his accusers, leading to a major leadership shakeup in the nonprofit Time's Up and other, other similar nonprofits. For his part, Cuomo continued to deny that he did anything wrong. He insists his actions were just being misinterpreted. He expressed regret about this, but he didn't acknowledge, even, even as he resigned, he, he acknowledged no wrongdoing. Um, instead, he argued that his behaviors were not only being misunderstood and perhaps misremembered by his accusers, but were being willfully misrepresented in the broader public by people with a nefarious agenda. Uh, so, um, you know, many, many other cases like this could be proliferated, and these cases are extreme. But as the sociologist Saskia Sassen argued, extreme cases can often be clarifying, right? So they can make obvious things that would otherwise be more subtle. And we can see from cases, from these cases, and cases like these, and, you know, there are many similar, uh, uh, academia is rife with examples of people engaging in inegalitarian behaviors while thinking of themselves as egalitarian, so as consulting or law or finance or, or any of these institutions. But by looking at extreme cases, we can easily see how moral lens, licensing, moral credentialing, and moral cleansing can help explain how people can benefit from and reproduce inequality while being convinced that they're deeply convinced that they are egalitarians. The trick, of course, is to be able to see these dynamics playing out, not just in these extreme cases, but in our own interactions, in our own institutions, in our own communities. And so part of what I'm hoping for the book is that I can help people do just that. And I'll leave it there, so uh, and I'll open up for Q&A. Thanks. Oh, sure. So how, you mean, so um, how institutions like universities engage in practices like moral credentialing or moral licensing? So, um, so one striking example is to consider okay, so in my book I have this example. So, cons so consider that there are these two instances of theft that occur, okay? In one case, the person takes something from someone else and, um, and they, you know, you know, they keep it from themselves, they profit from it, and, oh, but, oh, and over time, they, they, they forget uh, that, they're, they're, that to a significant extent, their later prosperity was built upon this theft. That's the first case. So someone steals something, they don't return it, they profit from it, and then they forget eventually even that the extent to which their own prosperity is based on this crime. Okay, scenario B, someone steals something from someone else. And they still don't return it, and they still profit from it, and they still... Only they constantly acknowledge the wrongdoing that they did verbally. It's so terrible. It's so terrible that I took this thing from you. I'm not going to give it back, but it's terrible that I took this thing from you. It's, it's terrible that you're suffering even as I'm flourishing. Someone really ought to do something about that. Okay, which of these is worse? In any case, it's, it's not clear to me, but in any case, um, the, the first case that I described, uh, the second case that I described is basically what happens with uh, land acknowledgments, right? And the first case is how people who do land acknowledgments describe people who don't. But, um, but when you look at what, like, a land, land acknowledgments are often these kind of empty gestures that universities 
and, and, and other institutions make where they say, oh, sure, it's terrible that this thing was done. Oh, I recognize that you have a right to this. I'm not going to give it to you, right? Um, so it's completely empty. I'm not going to do anything to rectify for this wrong that I'm acknowledging that occurred to you. Now, and the way that these land acknowledgments often play out, even, like as a result of, as a result of the very disenfranchisement that these land acknowledgments are supposed to be acknowledging, precisely as a result of that disenfranchisement, in a lot of these elite spaces, when people do land acknowledgments before a talk, for instance, there, there's unlikely to be a Native American person there to even like receive this acknowledgement, right? So it's mostly white people, or in any case, non-Native, non-Native, uh, non-Indigenous people, doing this gesture in front of other non-Native and Indigenous people, and they feel good about themselves for having made the gesture, and the people in the audience feel good for having heard the gesture, right? And so, like, again, it's this question of, like, who is this for, right? So in the, in the case where the very people who you're acknowledging are not there, and they're not there because of this crime that you're acknowledging, that you're not doing anything, not one thing to rectify. The only people benefiting from this practice are the people who are engaging in it and nodding along about how enlightened they are for having. And so universities do the same thing, right? So a lot of these universities, like, um, it would be well within the capacity of almost any university that put a land acknowledgement on their website to admit students from the tribes that they're recognizing as the rightful owners. They could admit those people for free, provide them full room and board, um, provide them with scholarships and other things like this. And some states do this, um, others don't. They could give them return on investment for their endowments, right? If, they, if they're recognizing these people as the rightful owners of the land, as these universities continue to build these large endowments, why shouldn't these people who are the rightful owners of the land get a cut of that? Well, Basically, no school did that. Um, okay, so, but, but universities, but this is an example, and there are other examples, like colloquially referred to as like greenwashing or woke washing or um, pink washing, where corporations, for instance, are very fond of being, uh, putting themselves front forward as being like supportive of social justice issues, but like supportive in a purely rhetorical way. So even as they're doing actions that disadvantage and marginalize and exploit the very populations that are continuing to champion, they kind of rhetorically put themselves. Now, one thing that's striking about this behavior is it's, is it's not just, is that it's sometimes damaging. It's actually damaging. So there are all of these studies, for instance, that show that, for, okay, so there's, there's, there are studies that show that, for instance, um, a lot of institutions, when they're trying to hire someone, they make these statements about how they don't discriminate against anyone and they absolutely encourage everyone who's a minority um, or uh, of any, any kind of sexual minority, gender minority, racial ethnic minority to apply. It turns out that these statements actually decrease, tend to decrease the number of minority applicants who apply to jobs. So this is signaling that employers do, but it's actually counterproductive. And there's actually a really interesting story for why it's counterproductive. Or it turns out that often when institutions engage in these kind of performative exercises, like forcing people to go, like um, when they issue these statements about how they support you know, political causes or have people go through um, anti-bias training of various sorts, which is, again, like the, the empirical literature. I wrote, a, <clears throat> I wrote an essay summarizing the empirical literature on a lot of these anti-bias trainings, not just as it relates to race, but also as it relates to gender, sexuality, ageism. The, the, the empirical literature across the board is that these trainings are usually ineffective. But, but worse, they're often counterproductive. <clears throat> and one of the specific ways that they're counterproductive is that they often encourage they often blind employer, uh, employees, the people who take these trainings, <clears throat> actually exit the training more blind to the behaviors that they engage in that are inegalitarian. So, um, <clears throat> so for instance, one common effect of the training, so in many cases, actually, when you look at sort of employee retention or turnover among minorities, the, the, the retention actually gets worse 
after, um, so, so not only does the training not make people of color more comfortable in their employed workspace, in their, in their places of employment, it often generates a more hostile environment for those employees. And part of the reason why, from the training, I mean from the, from the research on why, and why, why, why we see this outcome, part of the reason why it's because when employers or when employees in an organization do this training or are confronted with these messages about how the company cares or the organization cares about this, that, or the other thing, <clears throat> they come to see that organization is fundamentally fair. They come to see their organization as committed to. And so when some might, what, so when an employee expresses concern about their treatment, about being uh, discriminated against, about being harassed, or something like that. The other employees and the managers take that claim less seriously. How could you say that this, you know, look at the kind of place we are, we did this, right? So they actually take their complaints less seriously. And they actually, in, in many cases, actually become more likely to engage in these kind of pernicious behaviors as well. But they also, but they, they become, they take the, uh, the, the complaints less seriously in part because they, be, they become convinced as a result of these things that the organization is fundamentally fair. So they think the employee is being unreasonable in their complaints. And actually the employees themselves, the, the employees who are victimized themselves from, who are harassed or discriminated against, also, it turns out, struggle with this question of like, am I crazy, am I imagining it, right? Like, if the, uh, even more than they did before the training, because, precisely because, the management and the organization is putting such a supportive face on their behaviors and practices. It becomes actually, and so, and so sometimes um, employees, after, as a result of this in training, actually don't even come forward. They become less likely to come forward with complaints about harassment or, or because they don't, um, and so the problems that they have don't get addressed until they end up leaving. Rather than complaining and actually dealing with the problem, they end up leaving. And so often, these kinds of well-intentioned uh, well gestures towards showing that we, the organization, are on the side of actually um, have these kind of important adverse effects. Um, they can make, just, just, just in the same way that individual, when they engage in these kind of behaviors, can actually become more likely to act in egalitarian ways, when organizations do it, um, it actually it can cause the employees to behave in less egalitarian ways and uh, it can create a more hostile experience for the very people who they're supposed to be um, championing. And so this is the thing, is like uh, this kind of focus, this over-focus on saying the right thing and on doing the right kind of gestures, right, rather than like changing institutional, you know, Allocate, changing allocations of resources, changing policy, policy, you know, changing processes in a more meaningful way, setting up actual rate. This kind of focus on low-hanging fruit, easy things that are due. Uh, I mean, part of the reason why people rely heavily on these kind of diversity-related trainings, even though they're demonstrably ineffective and the literature has been showing they're ineffective for like decades, like decades of meta-analyses show that this stuff doesn't work. But people do it because it's low-hanging fruit. It's an easy thing to do, right? So after George Floyd was murdered, you know, what do colleges and universities do? Um, you know, let's do this. Let's, let's assign more anti-bias training. It's quick, it's easy, it shows that we're on the road, that we're doing something, right? Um, but, but these kind of gestural approaches to anti-racism and to other social problems often do more harm than good. Sure. Um, so, in the book itself, the book itself is more organized as like a, um, it's like less of a how-to than like a sort of, than a, than a sort of sociological analysis. But, but in the conclusion, I do spend some time on this because I think this is an important question, right? So like, 
Um, knowing what doesn't work is great, <laughs> but like knowing what does work is even better, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, uh, and so this question of like, well, what else could we do, right? How else could we do this? And there, uh, but, and there is there is actually some promising. For all of these things, there are actually some promise. So, so for instance, for for diversity related training, for the thing that I did on that, I talk about how that actually there there are from the very literature on that it shows why this stuff doesn't work and how it overwhelmingly fails and has from that literature you can actually derive some principles for like what a more effective approach to some of these things might look like. But but more broadly, for social justice advocacy. Uh, advocacy uh, in another paper I wrote called uh, Resistance is Sacrifice Towards an Aesthetic Anti-Racism, which was published in Sociological Forum. In that paper, I argued for something that I called um, an approach called aesthetic activism. And so the, the idea there is that rather than focusing on that the, the, that the best approach is to focus on like real good that you can do for actual people in local communities, right? So rather than focusing on beating racism per se, um, rather than focusing on that kind of abstract war with, right? And, and also like, and it's good to strive for policy, but like also like people fall into this trap sometimes where they, where they think, well, you know, I support say reparations, but you know, but what does it mean to support reparations, right? It means support it in your heart and mind, right? Uh, and so people do, like, the people support a lot of things in their heart and mind, and maybe they vote Democrat, but, oh, it turns out, well, the Democrats just, you know, they don't have enough votes. They don't have enough votes to do what they need to do, so I guess there's nothing we can do about it. We'll just wait four more years and see if we can get enough Democrats in the Senate, to, right? And so, like, this kind of focus sometimes on the political and the systemic, rather than being a means of action actually becomes a justification for inaction, right? There's nothing we can do. We just have to throw our hands up until the revolution comes. So what I argue for in that paper is that instead of that, right, <laughs> so you, people should still vote and they should still be politically organized and engaged and they should, right? I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. But that's not really going to, practically speaking, especially in the near term, like in the, in the, uh, a much more, you can, there are things that people can do to help real people in tangible ways in local contexts in their own communities. And so this is, um, this is what I advocate that people focus on. Uh, so like, to give an example, and, and to find ways to give of themselves rather than expropriating for others and blaming from others, finding things that you can do, ways that you can. <clears throat> so a prime example, in Manhattan, at, at Columbia, in the Upper West Side in Columbia, so, you know, when you talk to professors or, or grad students at Columbia, ask them about public schools. They all support public schools, big champions of public schools, public schools, yeah. Where do they send their own kids? They don't send their own kids to the public schools, they send their kids to private schools, overwhelmingly. And I know this because I send my own kid. I do send my kid to the public school, and there are not, uh, there are not many Colombians <laughs> there. Um, and. Uh, and this lack of investing one's own children, right, in these communities has a lot of consequences. It's not just about butts and seats. There are all of these uh, in, the, in the money that the extra however many dollars they could get from butts and seats. <clears throat> but it's also about the, you know, the, the kind of resources that these parents could raise um, and, uh, and the good that parents could do. Like in a lot of these other wealthier schools, these parents are engaged in, these, in the PTAs, are able to raise all sorts of. Be able to engage. Our poor kids got to experience those experiences, right? And the reason they don't is because a lot of the people who, who actually live in those communities just choose not to send their kids to the public school. So that's one example. And, 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 but, even, but even beyond that, right? Like there's all this research that shows that. When you have kids from more advantaged backgrounds that um, uh, attend these schools, especially if they don't segregate themselves into these special lines, like into these, uh, often when rich kids, uh, when, when, when rich parents, when wealthier, more affluent parents do send their children to public, 
<clears throat> schools in places like New York, they tried to like, segregate their children into these special programs <laughs> where they're still not really integrated, right? But, but when integration does happen, that can open up, actually that can be, um, that can prove to be a, that can improve the prospects for the other, for the, for the like under advantaged children who go there for a bunch of reasons. Um, there's cultural capital that ends up getting exchanged uh, in the sense there are uh, social networks that are forged that become useful. And so one of the easy things that people could do, for instance, if they support public schools, people in places like Manhattan, is send their own kids to their own public school, right? Uh, and the great thing about that is um, you don't have to pass any legislation, you don't have to overcome the, those dreaded Republicans interfering, right? You don't have to worry about any of that. You don't have to raise, all, like, all you have to do is yield to the default. You just, you don't, you literally have to do nothing except, <laughs> right? Which is a lot easier than um, the current approach of spending tens of thousands of dollars per year sometimes to send their kids to these private schools and going through these extreme testing rituals and all this stuff. <clears throat> so there are all sorts of things, and this is the point, because I guess there are all sorts of things that people can do that would make a tangible difference to people, to, to real people in a real community, right? Instead of haggling, instead of struggling over these abstract issues and these metapolitical issues and stuff like that. So, so my, my, my big sort of thing that I urge people to do is to focus on this, on doing tangible good for real people, concrete people in actual places. And then the second thing, I guess, is to have, is to be really attentive to orienting your approach to helping people around what those people actually want. <laughs> so in many cases, for instance, when people who are more, who are highly educated um, become involved with activist organizations, for instance, they often kill them, right? So often there are these grassroots movements to address social problems that were community-based, and then uh, kind of after when highly educated people go there and they're, whoa, we'll help you, and then they end up killing them. They end up killing those movements. And one of the reasons they end up killing those movements is because they kind of arrogantly assume, in many cases, that they know what's best or that they know what works better. And so they're, uh, often the activists or the, the, the organizers were doing things that work and, there's, and they're, uh, they have an approach that works, but rather than like, taking seriously the fact that these people have important knowledge that we could learn from and finding ways to support those initiatives, we try to you know, do this kind of executive approach and dictate what they should be focusing on and how they should. And often we focus on things that, that, that don't matter to people. So like there's this big focus, for instance, after, um, after George Floyd's murder on like, things like renaming schools. And you know, it's not like, uh, for a lot of parents, um, it's not like they, they, would, they would rather their school be named after Jefferson Davis than Rosa Parks, right? But like, if you ask the parents of the children in those schools, so they, they don't oppose the name change. But if you ask them, like, what are their priorities for that school, for their children? What are their concerns about their children's education? The name of the building is not going to be in the top five, right? <laughs> or the top 10, or the top 20, or anywhere like that. But rather than focusing on the things that those parents are actually concerned about, right? Uh, you know, you know um, there's a temptation to focus on these kind of symbolic victories. Oh, we changed the name to Rosa Parks. Sure, your kids still can't go to classes in person and they're falling behind in math and, you know, there's, the, the water fountains are gross and, what, what, you know, or your, your children aren't getting the experience. But, but we changed the name, right? Like, so this, this kind of, so efforts should be focused on, like, what, taking seriously this question of, like, well, what are the people we're trying to help? What do they want? What do they care about? What are their priorities? Kind of basing our approach to supporting those things rather than dictating what they should be focused on based on what's good for us, what feels good for us, what's satisfying for us, right? Um, that was a long answer. I said it was gonna be a short answer, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a, a longer question, I don't think it's somewhat related. Um, it, it has to do with the
I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think that's an example of uh, moral. So moral cleansing is often this kind of uh, is often a way to of diverting kind of guilt that you feel about yourself by kind of focusing on other people on, on, on some other else, right? So like you take this terrible feeling you have about yourself and you kind of push <laughs> push it on someone, find someone else who's doing the same kind of thing. Uh, you know. um, uh, that, that's one of the more, uh, that's the most most common expression of moral cleansing. But the, the um, you know, uh, this question about, you know, one thing that's interesting about some of these affirmative action strategies is that there is evidence that at least some of them, not all of them, but some of them are miscalibrated. So what sometimes what, for instance, um, there's evidence of occasional mismatches. So what mismatching is, is like sometimes students get accepted into a, like a super rigorous or elite program that they aren't adequately prepared for. And that in itself isn't a problem, except the problem is that often uh, after they get admitted, the student, the school just goes, okay, well, Luck. And then they don't do anything to like actually support those students when they get admission, right? And so they end up um, uh, struggling and often like failing out and dropping out and, and things like this. Um, and so the problem there isn't that they admitted it, right? The problem isn't actually the admissions in, the, in these cases. The problem is that you admitted people who you recognize as having come from an uh, from an, uh, uh, an underprivileged background, and so that who you implicitly recognize might not be. Uh, fully prepared to like, succeed in this environment, might not be fully prepared to kind of flourish in this environment. And in fact, in addition to the kind of like academic things, there are all these cultural things. Like, so I, I started at community college when I was at University of Arizona, and then I made this kind of weird journey to Columbia. And like, um, even the sort of cultural shock <laughs> of like, that, that people can experience sometimes when they kind of do these transitions, right, can be difficult. Um, to find your place fully. And so there's this, uh, and so there's this problem sometimes though where, where like the way that administrators often approach these issues is that like what a lot of it, sometimes university administrators are very concerned with showing, being able to show like their statistics of like how many people they admitted from these categories, being able to like, have this nice number, this nice sign that they're able to show people. And they're less focused on making sure that, again, the people who admitted, who are admitted, actually can flourish and succeed or whatever. So after they get admitted, so. And this is a criticism that, this is like a version of this criticism that's directed against conservatives sometimes, right? Like, you say you're pro-life, but then once the baby comes out, you don't really care what happens to them, right? And so there's like this, there's the same kind of thing that a lot of, that, that institutions do sometimes, where they, you know, we say we want you here, and then once you're here, well, good luck, <laughs> right? And that's, that's not necessarily the best way to actually work. Right, so that, that's, that's, that's a problem sometimes with those kind of policies that you just described. Um, not in all cases, but in many cases. Yeah. Well, so there, there's this, there is this, there's this really, there's this really bad, there's this really kind of gnarly problem around science communication in America that's, that's kind of terrible. I was talking a little bit about this at dinner with, but like, um, okay, so there's this great work by this guy at Yale, uh, Dan K. 
does a lot of work on cultural cognition. And what he found, for instance, is that it turns out that people who are climate, what you would call climate change deniers, people who, who climate change skeptics, this may be a better term. Climate change skeptics tend to be much, tend to be significantly better well-versed on climate science than climate change, than people who accept a scientific consensus about climate change. And you can see why that would be, actually, because for a, a lot of people, the people who just accept a sort of consensus position, they don't feel the need to do research. They just trust the scientists, right? They, oh, does the, does the authorities say this? Okay, well, it's this. And they don't, you know. <clears throat> but if you're a skeptic, um, then uh, you have to do a lot of research to justify your position. You're all, constantly arguing with people. You're, you're, you have to, you're, you're finding these other authorities. So not only are you kind of a little bit familiar with the consensus climate science, but then you're also finding these other people and understanding the differences between, like, what are the arguments for why, et cetera. And this is true for a lot of issues. And then, but, and then the way that these kind of debates often happen then <laughs> is that people who are actually well, better versed than the people who accept the consensus position get in arguments with people who are of the consensus position, and those people are, have less substantive knowledge about the issue that they're arguing with, right? They actually know this stuff less, they've done less research, but they condescend this person who actually ha has a little bit more research and actually has a deeper knowledge. They condescend to them even though they don't know anything really about climate science, right, just because the experts say X. And that's not a very productive way of, right? And that, that, that tends to, that kind of approach only tends to um, polarize people more. And there's this other, and there's a kind of related problem that has happened um, not just, uh, especially with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic where There's a lot of uncertainty, right? There's a lot of things that scientists don't understand about. Um, that they, and, and, and they make models for different things and the uncertainty regarding those models. So a lot of times the, the people who are, the people in the CDC, for instance, who are the scientists, they have this fear that if they communicate the uncertainty that undergirds a lot of their stuff, if they communicate, you know, what they don't know and, you know, what the, how, that, this is a probability rather, right? If they, if, they, if they really foreground this uncertainty, they fear that people won't take them as seriously. But actually, there's all this research, again, on the cognitive and behavioral sciences that shows that actually when, you, when, you, when, when people are more upfront about uncertainty, to, um, they, they actually believe you more. They're more inclined to believe you if you're, being on, if you're just being forth, forthright about uncertainty. But a lot of the people who are leading these agencies, who are, are you know, they're not well-versed in that literature, they're well-versed in like epidemiology, right? This, that's not their bag. Science communication is not their bag necessarily. Um, and so they, they rely on these kind of assumptions about how other people will react. And so they, they put on this very public face of like, of certainty and of surety and of like, you know, uh, and then when it turns out that they're wrong, or when the model doesn't go as it forecasted, or they have to change their mind about something, because they said, we're sure, and we're positive, and they didn't convey this uncertainty, then when they have to shift, it looks really sketchy, right, to people, <laughs> um, like, and, and especially because then they strike their new position also in a very firm and confident way. And so the, you know, the, the same CDC that was very firmly telling people, for instance, that masking was not necessary, and just, then later changed them saying masking actually was important and necessary, and then, oh, actually, cloth masks are garbage, and you can only, right, but, and, and, and like at e each step of this, they projected, the, they tried to project this, like, kind of thing, and that's actually counterproductive, it turns out, like, that kind of changing your position while taking these very firm stances and very confident stances makes people less trusting. Um, and so there, 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 there are these kind of scientific communication problems, and then later on, there are these cultural problems where, like, uh, once something gets tied to these kind of moral and uh, identity issues, you know, so, so, I mean, one concern that I have is that 
Okay, so you can look at universities. So before it was the case, when you did polls and surveys and stuff, like Republicans would, would constantly say, you know, those darn liberal professors, like they've been long distrustful of professors, but they thought universities themselves, they didn't have necessarily a problem with universities themselves. In fact, when you looked at polling and surveys, Republicans are very supportive of universities per se. It was certain liberal professors in the humanities and social sciences that were the problem. But now, in polling and surveys, when you ask Republicans about universities themselves, about whether universities on balance, universities themselves do harm, more harm than good, growing majority of Republicans say universities themselves are on balance pernicious to society. So it's not just the professors, it's the higher education itself. And I worry that we're approaching a similar dynamic with respect to science and scientists. So, like, there's a lot of research that shows that right now, as things currently stand, there's a lot of mistrust of scientists. But there's not actually not. There's a broad support and broad trust in science. So even COVID, I mean, even um, like climate change uh, skeptics, for instance. There's this great book by a sociologist called Gila, named Gil Ayal. It's called The Crisis of Expertise. And he demonstrates how even COVID-19, I mean, climate change skeptics, um, basically concede most of the argument. Like, COVID-19 skeptics, I keep saying COVID-19 skeptics, climate change skeptics. Um, their, their primary thing is they, they, don't, they don't usually argue that climate science is bunk, and that science is bad, right? They, 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 in fact, they say the evidence isn't there yet. We need more evidence. We need more, uh, more science, more research, etc. Now, notice this actually concedes almost everything, almost everything to the establishment. It says that the terms of the that this is a dispute that's to be settled by empirical evidence. That more science is good. They they, they implicitly support more science, right? The, so they support these people hacking their jobs and the money to do the research in principle. It concedes almost everything. The one thing it doesn't concede, Ayal points, is that like the, the, the people who are in favor of doing something about climate change, precisely what they want to do is move beyond the science, move beyond the empirical questions to the like, to these trans-scientific questions, these questions that are not about just whether the facts, but like of these questions about what do we do about them, these kind of political and moral questions. And the skeptics want to keep things focused on the facts, right? This is actually the source of the tension between these camps. Is that well, I'm trying not to block. Another one of my other blocks are the facts. Well, they're not necessarily, but but like running out the clock to what? Like right, like right, like they don't want to, they don't want to die. They don't want their killed children to die or anything like that. Like they have like sincere, they have you know sincere doubts about. Um, but, it, but, but yeah, so, so my concern though is that to the extent that during COVID, the terms of COVID-19 crisis and related to this, to the extent that there are these kind of semi-conscious efforts to tie science itself, not, not even just scientists, but science per se, to one political and cultural faction in America, right? Um, that's probably going to be damaging in the long run for like, well, that, that could lead more people to not just distrust scientists, certain scientists, but to distrust science per se. To the extent that you have these marches and people are like, you know, we're the science and we're anti-Trump, or we're the science and we're pro-Biden, or we're the science and we're for Black Lives Matter, right? To the extent that the science, science itself, then people representing science are tying that identity as scientists, are tying the identity of their institutions to these political parties and stuff. That's ill-advised and will probably do more harm than good in the long run, um, including with respect to the influence of science and scientists and the viability of the research. Uh, this is a fear that I have about the way that some people are kind of actively dragging their professions into the culture wars. That, especially among the kind of highly educated, uh, you know, class. Why, in some in some ways, they're sort of more focused on international problems than domestic ones. Honestly, I think that part of the 
part of the issue is that the, the place is There's a perception, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, that those people deserve their suffering, and that those people live in those communities that are being called out and called on by us. If they don't, if they have a problem, they should just learn to code and move to the cities or the um, And so to the extent that they choose to remain in those communities, their suffering is kind of their own fault. Um, so I think there's just a general lack of concern uh, in many cases with the people who live in flyover country. The people are not in Manhattan and DC and wherever they're just like that. They're just not concerned with them. Not really. There they would be more there would be more concern about teaching uh, about you know promoting women's education in Afghanistan than they would be, you know, helping people who live in rural Ohio. <laughs> Um, that's, that's just, they, you know, um, and uh, you know, I personally find that atrocious, but, but that's my honest assessment. Um, this question about uh, immigrants and how, you know, it's, it's striking, it's like, uh, immigrants have often been on kind of the forefront of a lot of these struggles for, for, for various, um, various forms of economic justice and social justice. And there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of interesting reasons for, for why that is, including the, among them being that, you know, many immigrant populations, so when, a lot of times when people um, come to America, they settle in communities around other, like they're, they, they settle in communities with these Strong social, stronger social and cultural bonds than a lot of their, than a lot of their uh, peers. And this, this actually, this is important for a number of reasons. One, because it helps people, it helps a lot of first generation immigrant families especially cope with some of the major adjustments and challenges um, that, that uh, you know, that are implicated with living in America, with dealing with some of these structural But, it often, but, it, but oftentimes, these networks can also serve as a basis for mobilization and organization. So there was a great, um, in New York City, for instance, recently, uh, there are a handful of these uh, sort of, of these immigrant-driven social justice campaigns that are happening. So, so for one, in New York City, for instance, the people who are delivering food uh, to, to, to Manhattanites by member, by, through like DoorDash or Grubhub or something like that. There is this, uh, in New York City, according to a lot of analysis, the people who do this are like 90% of the people who do these jobs in Manhattan are undocumented immigrants, uh, mostly from Central and South America or, Af or, or, or a handful of countries in Africa. In some in some East Asian countries, and they've actually been able to, and, and you know, the, they they face a number of struggles. Not only because the the, the, the sort of apps they work for are very exposed to the labor conditions, but then also that they they do dangerous jobs, and people are often preyed upon as well by robbers and stuff. Um, and it's difficult to turn to formal authorities. Uh, because if you're an undocumented immigrant and you're injured or whatever, and you go to a hospital or, or if you're robbed and you try to consult the police, you, in some cases, risk deportation. And so what ended up happening is that a number of, of, uh, of these workers ended up forming these groups of like mutual aid and defense to protect one another from being robbed. And in some cases, to actually, like, when they have these, like, they, they, a lot of times the people who deliver this food, they, they use these e-bikes, which are expensive, and they cost $2,500. And so for a lot of these workers, it's more than one's pay. This bike gets stolen from you, and they're a prime target. And so in some cases, they actually, like, even organize, like, kind of raids to get their bikes back. Now, that's not ideal. 
But more than that, but more than this kind of, so what started this, this initial movement of kind of mutual aid and defense has actually been morphing though into the social movement for better pay and better working conditions for the drivers themselves. Um, and again, like in principle in a super liberal place like Manhattan, the people who are consuming these would maybe be the ones that you would expect to be more, you would maybe expect to be more concerned about this than they are, but they're not. Uh, but, the, but you know, the people who are doing, are, are organizing and lobbying in a way that might actually, um, that, that has already actually resulted in a number of changes to laws in, Man in, in New York City with respect to gig workers, and um, it's probably going to uh, achieve more down the line. And so, you know, oftentimes in immigrant communities, precisely as a result of the kind of close community ties and the, and the sort of cultural bonds they have, are in a good position actually to organize in the way that sometimes um, other populations aren't. And they've been often at the forefront of these kind of uh, social justice uh, movements. Um, in fact, there was another case regarding taxis in New York, but I think it would be a long excursus to go into that. But um, I guess, uh, again, I, I'll just say that. I agree with your, uh, I agree with the sentiment that immigrants can play an important role in kind of pushing for these issues. And I think uh, in, in many cases they do, especially in, um, you see this a lot in cases like, in, in places like New York or Los Angeles where there are large immigrant populations that are, you know, congregated in one spot. 